Bible this morning, if you would join me in Mark chapter 11. We've had a couple of month break from this study, but this morning we uh, commence and um, the next, probably the rest of the year, we'll be finishing up in this wonderful good news as recorded by Mark. If you can remember from two months ago, uh, the Lord Jesus has entered his final week, and he has come to Jerusalem. There's been quite a stir as the crowds outside of Jerusalem have cried out, Hosanna, blesses you, comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus has entered, he has uh, cleansed the temple, and probably gone back to Bethany for the night. And now he comes back again to Jerusalem the next morning. We pick up in verse 27. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? And by the way, that's not a completely illegitimate question. Um, As religious leaders, they have the responsibility for someone who's going to come in and cause a stir to find out the authority. But as we'll see, it was a very, very insincere question. Jesus, in verse 29, said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And then with great authority, he says, answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? And by the way, why did you not believe him about me? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your authoritative word. And today we simply pause to ask that you would bless The teaching of your word, we pray that you would take this Holy Spirit, make a difference in our lives, and and please show us afresh, or in some cases for the first time, the authority of Jesus. May he be lifted up today. May he be glorified in our midst. And as he is lifted up, may we be drawn to him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. provocatively, could have entitled this sermon, Who's the Boss? Because fundamentally, that is what these religious leaders are asking. And Jesus' non-answer gives the answer, he is. Christians need to remember this. And non-Christians need to know this. And every one of us needs to submit to this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means that he is the boss. And whether we realize it or not, he is is our boss. Last Sunday night, we prayed throughout this week for Crystal Park Baptist Church, our sister church of the week. And as I read the report that went out about this church, I was struck by a particular paragraph. Mark Penrith wrote this as the pastor He says, we have been consistently teaching these following distinctives. Expository preaching, biblical leadership, congregational involvement, believers' baptism, and lordship salvation. And that struck me, that phrase, lordship salvation, because I appreciate Mark's boldness. Because this teaching, sometimes termed lordship salvation, over the years has invited a whole lot of 
opposition, a whole lot of debate, a whole lot of unfortunate name-calling, fraternal excommunication, and even church splits. And yet, nevertheless, Crystal Park Baptist Church teaches what the Bible teaches, is that when somebody is born again, they receive Jesus Christ not merely as Savior, thank God for that, but as their Lord. Lordship salvation. That is, they recognize and submit to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1988, I was, 1988 and 89, my wife and I were living in Australia where I was pastoring for a while. And a friend of mine named Jeff Nickel came over, he's a pastor, and was visiting, and he was reading a book that had just come off the press called uh, The Gospel According to Jesus by John MacArthur. And he said, this is a really good book. And when he got done reading it, he gave it to me before he went back to the States. And I remember reading that book and thinking, this is great because this is simply what the Bible teaches, that when people are born again, they receive Jesus Christ as Lord. But that book, it turned out, was like a theological shot heard around the world. And all kinds of debate rose up, and people called John MacArthur a heretic, saying that he was adding works to the gospel. He was doing nothing of the kind. He was simply pointing out that when, when someone is saved, they receive Jesus Christ as Lord. In other words, when someone is born again, their life transforms. They follow the lordship of Jesus Christ. And I've often thought, thought why a, a message that through the ages has been a consistent message of the church, why in our particular era is that such a problem? And perhaps it's because of the anti-establishment um, uh, mentality that arose in the 1960s in much of the West. I can remember, and I was just a little kid, but I remember a book came out by a Dr. Spock, not, not this Dr. Spock. <laughs> However you do that. But this Dr. Spock wrote a book about raising kids, and it was a revolutionary book, and basically it was taking away parents' authority. And a skeptical, cynical mind towards authority began to grow and even began to infect churches. So churches became hesitant to preach, thus saith the Lord, according to the word of God. And with that, churches began to lose their grip on the gospel of God and how God has designed the gospel to bring us to submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. People didn't stop preaching about Jesus. They preached that Jesus was a panacea for all of our ills. He was, he was seen as a savior, but more of a therapeutic kind of savior rather than a life-transforming, soul-transforming savior. Many times that Jesus was presented as a savior they were almost entitled to. But the last thing that was ever taught was in many churches was that Jesus Christ has a right to tell us what to do. Jesus Christ, as our lover, replaced the idea of Jesus as our Lord with very, very tragic results. The church became bloated with false professions of faith as people did not repent of their sins, but they simply prayed a prayer and thought they were okay because they had this life insurance, this, this, this fire insurance from hell through Jesus. This minimizing of the authority of Jesus Christ resulted in many cases in stunted spiritual growth and deeply inconsistent Christian living. And the net effect was a weakened weakening of churches. Now, this problem of rejecting the authority of, of God is not a new problem. All the way back in the garden in, in Eden, man, sinful man, has resisted God's Authority, fallen, sinful humanity, rejects the lordship of its creator. We've listened to the lie of the devil and ignored the authoritative word of God. We want to call the shots. And in our commitment to our own autonomy, to our own self-rule, we resist those who interfere with this, including Jesus. Many in their more saner moments realize that they need help and we realize we have a problem, a problem of a breakdown in our relationship with God. And so we're grateful for a Messiah who will reconcile us to God. We're, we're grateful for a Savior who will die for our sins and who will rise again to, to justify us. But the offense comes, it arises when the Savior begins to tell us what to do. 
There's a sense in where many say, well, Jesus, I appreciate your dying for my sins, and I'm grateful that you bore uh, the wrath of God on my behalf. I'm thankful that you rescued me from eternal condemnation and for giving me eternal life, and I'll praise you for this. I even say amen to this. But when it comes to telling me how to live, well, I can do just fine on my own. Thank you very much. This anti-authority attitude has always been present, and we see an example of it in our text this morning with these who should have known better, these religious leaders. They had a major problem with lordship of Christ. And as we examine these verses today, very simply and very perhaps briefly, I want us to, as Christians, to be reminded that we constantly need this truth before us that Jesus Christ is our Lord. That we need the reminder that he is our authority and that he is the one to be calling the shots in our lives. If you are not a Christian, I trust that by the Spirit of God you'll come to see that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. The Lord Jesus Christ who has all authority in heaven and earth. And because he has all authority, he can save you. Let me give you three things from this passage before we pull it together and apply it at the end of the sermon. First of all, we see the boldness of Jesus. And in this boldness, we see the authority of Jesus. It says, and they came again to Jerusalem. And they came again to Jerusalem. As they come to Jerusalem, as we'll see, as we've already read, Jesus is going to be confronted by the religious leaders from the Sanhedrin, questioning his authority. But it's interesting how this passage about his authority opens up with that he came again to Jerusalem. Remember in chapter 8 and verse 31, and in chapter 9 and verse 31, and in chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, Jesus said to the disciples, we are go- I am going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be betrayed. And the chief priest and the elders, they are going to rise up against me, and they are going to murder me. Jesus had come to Jerusalem. He is, as it were, thrown down the gauntlet just A day before he is gone, he has cleansed the temple. He has caused quite a stir. And you don't find Jesus hiding. You find Jesus the next day coming again to Jerusalem. He comes to Jerusalem and this boldness speaks of his authority. The place he has predicted that he will be murdered, Jesus Christ with great authority, comes again. We read in Luke's account Luke chapter 19, that before Jesus entered Jerusalem for the first time, he was weeping outside of the city gates. He was weeping over Jerusalem because of two things, because of the corruption of of the city, because of the corruption of the worship, particularly under the leadership, the, the pathetic leadership of these religious leaders. When Jesus came to the temple, he saw that the house of prayer for all the nations had been corrupted. And there was all this commercializing of the worship of God taking place in the court of the Gentiles, hindering people from worshiping God. That was at the responsibility of these leaders who will confront him. But Jesus comes to actually, again, to throw down the gauntlet and to face these who have an authority problem. He's going to come with great authority. It's interesting, all the way from the beginning of Mark's gospel, we see this authority of Jesus. At his baptism, the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It's a voice of authority. He goes into the wilderness, and he is once again tempted by the uh, the devil, and, and, and he's victorious. He exercises authority over the evil one. He then proclaims authoritatively the kingdom of God. He authoritatively calls the disciples to himself. He casts out demons. He heals people with great authority. He even makes the claim in chapter 2 that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. In chapter 3, when some of the representatives from Jerusalem are sent down to, to actually oppose him, They said that he is 
casting out demons by Beelzebub. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. He says, I am binding the strong man. In other words, I have more authority than any. In chapter 4, you remember when that the, the storm breaks out in the sea and Jesus with his word, he exercises authority over creation, over the seas, and over the storms. In chapter 6 and chapter 8, he feeds the multitudes miraculously from the few scones and, and few sardines. He exercises authority as creator. His teaching was such that the, the common people heard him gladly. They said, we've never heard such authoritative teaching. He makes prophetic announcements like he's going to Jerusalem and he will be killed. His, his, his teaching is filled with authority. His, everything he's doing is just has this aura of authority. But I would suggest to you that his coming again to Jerusalem was a supreme statement of his authority because he was coming as a man under authority. He was coming under the authority of the Father who had designed for him from before the creation of the world that he would go to Jerusalem and that there he would be betrayed. There he would be crucified, but he'd also rise again. Jesus proves his authority as one who is under authority. He comes and confronts these men. And we see there, secondly, their belligerence. It says, and they came again to Jerusalem. By the way, give the disciples some credit. They could have been very nervous about this, but they're with Jesus. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. Let me just pause there for a moment. There is a group of 71 leaders called the Sanhedrin. They were made up of the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. And so a representation from that Sanhedrin, I'm sure it wasn't all of them, but a representative group, they come to Jesus and, and they confront him. And they said to him in verse 28, by what authority are you doing these things or who gave you this authority to do them? Now, now granted, these leaders have not seen everything that the reader of Mark has been exposed to. But they've heard enough reports, so much so that in chapter 2 and 3, they send a delegation to see Jesus and to speak with him, to observe him. They understand something of his authority. They see that there is some authority about him. But they come to him because Jesus, the day before, has just cleansed the temple. And they say, by what authority do you do these things? I've mentioned this before. I found it astounding that when Jesus cleanses the temple, nobody raised their hand to stop him. And there's hundreds, thousands of people there. But there was such a moral authority about Jesus Christ that no one stopped him. And they questioned him, by what authority do you do this? Jesus will answer them, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. He doesn't answer them directly because of their belligerence. These who should know better, they are questioning the authority of Jesus. They're not asking an honest, humble question, but rather from an arrogant, rebellious, self-preserving motive. They want to guard their position, and they know that Jesus' cleansing of the temple was really an attack upon their leadership. That they were like those in Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34. They were shepherds who were not leading God's people. They were misleading them. And so for Jesus to come and to rebuke and to cleanse the temple was a rebuke of them. And rather than being confronted by God in the flesh and repenting of their sin, they have the audacity to ask him by whose authority he does this. Well, why doesn't Jesus just say, I have the authority of God? Why doesn't he just answer them directly? What I suggest to you, he doesn't answer them directly because the Bible speaks about the fact you don't answer a fool according to the folly. That these people were not asking some kind of an honest question. I shared last week a Skype call I had with a man in India, a Muslim man who's looking for the truth. And I so appreciated his questions. He wasn't asking as a scoffer. He wasn't asking as a cynic. It was quite clear he was asking very sincerely about Jesus. And was Je- is Jesus God? He-, he was asking a question because he was looking for the truth. These people are not looking for a tr- the truth. They're looking for a way to 
to really entrap Jesus. As the religious leaders, they have some responsibility for what happens here at the temple. And if Jesus doesn't have legitimate authority, then they can embarrass him in front of the people. The people can rise against him. The question about authority, and that brings us to his response. His response is simply this. He answers their question with a question. He's done that before in chapter 10. He'll do it again. I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you about what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And, and notice this, answer me. Isn't that an authoritative statement? These leaders, they want an answer. And Jesus says to them, I will ask you one question and you answer me. I will tell you about what authority I do these things. And he asks this very simple question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. He's, he's trapped them. They were trying to trap him. And I think that there's a sense in which Jesus was trying to trap them, in a sense, out of grace. Because he's confronting them with an all-important question. They were familiar with John the Baptist's ministry. And his baptism of repentance was all based on the fact that, Jesus, that John the Baptist was coming as the forerunner of Messiah, right? He says, prepare the way of the Lord. I am coming before Messiah to prepare the way. He's coming. Prepare, repent, and believe this message. And so when Jesus asked them this question, if they say John the Baptist's authority was from heaven, that his uh, ministry was authentic, then they would have to admit that Jesus is Messiah. You see that? That's the last thing they want to do. I'll come back to that in a moment. But look at their deliberation. It says, and they discussed it with one another. That particular word for disgust in the ESV, I'm not sure what it is in other translations, but it's found seven times in Mark. And every time you find this word, it's in the context of those resisting God's truth, resisting the teaching of Jesus. So they're not discussing this sincerely. They're, they're, they're debating how do we get out of this. And they said, if we say, you just see this huddle together and Jesus standing on the side, patiently waiting. If we say from heaven, he's going to say, then why did you not believe him? Can I flesh that out? Then Jesus is going to say to us, why then did you not believe John the Baptist about me? That I'm Messiah. But if we say from man, well, we're going to be in big trouble. Because they're afraid of the people. Because the people all saw John really as a prophet. They kind of were like many politicians. They kind of taking a poll to see where they should stand on this. One commentator made a really helpful observation. He said, sadly, these leaders did not consider what was true and what was false. They considered rather what was safe and what was unsafe. How many people do that when they're confronted with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? They don't consider whether or not his truth claims are true. They, they, don't, they don't consider whether what the claims of the gospel are true or false. Their first thought is, what is safe for me? Because if I repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ understanding something of his authority, that's going to mean a change in my life. And how's it going to go with my wife or with my husband or with my children or with my parents or in the workplace or with my religious system? To play it safe they answered Jesus, and they lied. 
Think about that. They're lying to the Son of God. They're, they're lying to the light of the world. They're lying to the one who is the truth. They answered and said, Jesus, we do not know. Sure, sure they knew. They knew that John the Baptist was a legitimate prophet. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. He's not going to answer a fool according to their folly. Now, this whole scene is very, very significant. Go with me to Malachi chapter 3, and let me try to put this together. In Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, just a few pages left, there is this prophecy In verse 1, God says to Old Covenant Israel, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his what? His what? His temple. Now, just pause there. When Jesus asked this question to these leaders about John the Baptist, I would imagine it would have hearkened, they would have hearkened to Malachi chapter 3. And what's interesting is, where is this taking place in Mark chapter 11? It's taking place in the, the temple. Jesus was saying, you scholars... You Old Testament experts, you religious leaders, John the Baptist foretold my coming, and he foretold my coming that I would be suddenly coming to this temple. For them to say, we acknowledge the authority of John from heaven, we acknowledge the truthfulness of his ministry, would have been for them to acknowledge that Jesus Christ was Messiah. And what's interesting about Malachi's prophecy is this, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. The picture here is that when Messiah comes to the temple, everybody's saying, come, come, come. And when he comes, they're going to say, woe is us. Because he doesn't come like them and say, everything is fine. He comes with the authority of God and he says, you have corrupted this and I am going to refine it. Which is exactly what he did in cleansing the temple. This whole passage just, just breathes of Jesus' authority. He comes with boldness to this place again. He answers the challenge with a voice of authority, and he finally answers it with this silence of authority. And then we'll see next week, and I'm not done yet, but we'll see next week. Don't get too excited. In chapter 12, Jesus will flesh this out even more, that because they've rejected the authority of the Son, they are headed for judgment. So what do we learn from this? It's quite clear amongst, I'm sure, many things that I have not yet discovered. It is quite clear that this passage is pointing us to the authority of Jesus Christ. We're confronted with the fact that he has the authority over the temple. He has the authority over everything and over everyone. And as I contemplated the authority of Jesus, I thought about just a few important applications for us. And the first one is this, is remember that salvation, the gospel, is an authority issue. That was the problem of these religious leaders. They would not submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. And because of that, they're going to be, they're going to be condemned with the rest of Jerusalem when it is destroyed. They talk about that in chapter 12. But salvation, the gospel, is an authority issue. I remember growing up, my pastor 
over and over again making this statement. He said, people, we make lousy lords. We make lousy lords. We need the Lord to save us. We like to live autonomously, self-rule, making our own rules. But when it comes to the gospel, we need to realize that salvation is all about submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ. Our Psalm of the Week, providentially, is Psalm 2. And the steward explained it to us. Talks about our rebellion and trying to cast away the cords, cast away the authority of God from us. And he who sits in the heaven is not challenged by that. He laughs, he scoffs, and he says that one day he's going to show that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he does that by his death, burial, and his resurrection. And then he gives that voice of invitation, kiss the son, bow the knee, lest it be too late. It's all about bowing to the authority of Jesus Christ. And in light of that, secondly, we need to examine ourselves whether we truly are in the kingdom of God. Are we truly in the kingdom of God? And how do you know that? Well, one of the ways is, is there evidence of submission in your life to the word of Jesus Christ? It's interesting in Luke chapter 6 where Jesus made this statement. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? He said there's going to be many who come to him and they're going to say, didn't I do this and do this in your name? And what's Jesus going to say? Depart from me. I never knew you. A dear saint that I often have spoken to over the years. She said to me, she she often said to me, my biggest fear is standing before God and hearing those words. And I have to kind of kind of walk her off the ledge and take her back to the gospel and help her to see the evidence of of Christ in her life. But I'm grateful that she takes it seriously. There are many people who claim to be Christians, but when it comes to the authority of Jesus Christ, there's no evidence of submission to that. He's not Lord over their time or over their treasures or over their talents. He's not Lord over their work or over their walk or even in their worship. I was reading this week in Exodus, and I thought about this passage when Moses comes to Pharaoh And and says to Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. And listen to the words of Pharaoh. He says this, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I do not know the Lord. And therefore, I will not let Israel go. Hey, at least he was consistent. I don't know the Lord. I don't recognize his authority. And therefore, I will not do what he says. Can I ask you this? My design is not to cause those who are in Christ to be um, unnecessarily disturbed in their faith. But I do want to kind of disturb the comfortable. You say, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I am a Christian. Or is there an evidence in your life that you recognize his authority? You say, well, I will not love my wife as Christ loved the church or I will not submit to my husband, or I will not submit to the elders of my church, or I will not forgive, and I will not forbear. I will not be tenderhearted. I will not serve. I will not love one another. I will not obey my parents. I will not repent of my lying. I will not repent of my looking at pornography. I will not repent of my bitterness. If that's an attitude of the heart, then you may have prayed for Jesus to be your Savior, but can I appeal to you, bow the knee to Christ today as Lord and Savior? If we love him, we've been saved by him, then we will keep his commandments. Can I say this thirdly, that when we evangelize, make sure we tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You know, our good works do not save us, right? And that's not being, that's not what's being proclaimed here today. What's being proclaimed is this, is that when we see who Jesus Christ is and we see his authority, then we see our sinfulness, we bow in repentance to him. And so as we evangelize, you don't go through a whole list and say, now do you have this in your life and this in your life? I I remember evangelizing someone some years ago and got to the end of, of this and they just seemed so keen and uh, this, it was a man, he said, I need to ask you something. He said, uh, I'm actually living with my girlfriend. 
And he said, if I become a Christian, what does that mean? And some would advise, just ignore that question. Because if he prays, that's what you're looking for. And I remember simply saying to him, well, if the Lord saves you, he becomes your Lord, he becomes your boss, and he's going to tell you to stop that. And never forget, he looked at me and he said, you know, as great as this all sounds, I'm not willing to lose her. What was the problem there? The problem there was an authority problem. Not saying the authority of Jesus Christ, that he has the right to demand how we live our lives. When we evangelize, we must be clear that Jesus Christ is Savior. He's King. He is Lord. Those who see the authority of Jesus Christ, they're committed to living a life in submission to him. That's going to have many, many applications, many implications. I think about the fact that if we are believers in Jesus Christ, then there's going to be a submission to his body. If someone is is truly born again, they want to be a part of the body of Christ, right? I'm deeply burdened when I speak to people who are I don't doubt are wonderful Christians, and they'll tell me that about some friend or a loved one. They'll say, you know, I, I, in fact, when I was overseas, I was talking to somebody, and they, and they were saying, no, this person is a Christian because at one time they had prayed this prayer and they joined a church. They had been in church for 30 years. There's a problem there, is there not? If we have submitted our knee to Jesus Christ, if we have bowed the knee to him, If he is our authority, then we're going to be involved in what he's involved in, which is his body, which is the church. The authority of Jesus Christ. If you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're not a Christian, can I exhort you to repent, to submit to his authority today? He indeed is trustworthy. You know, we live in an age where there's great cynicism towards authority. Some of it is legitimate, some of it is not. But if you are skeptical about the authority of Jesus Christ, I want to assure you today that Jesus Christ is worthy of your trust. Jesus Christ keeps his word, he kept his promise. He kept his promise to the Father. The Father said, If you go and die for a people that I have chosen, I will give them to you for you to die for. As you rise from the dead, I will give them to you forever. Jesus Christ came to earth. He came and he obeyed the Father. He took upon himself the very body prepared for him by the Father. He, He lived a life completely in submission to the authority of his Father. What a wonderful thing he said in John 8, 29. Wouldn't you love to be able to say this? I always do those things that please my father. Jesus Christ completely obeyed the authority of his father. He lived a sinless life. He kept his promise. He, went, he said to the disciples three times, I'm going to go and I'm going to die. Who's he dying for? He's dying for them. He's dying for all those who will bow the knee to him. And because he kept The word of the Father. Because he obeyed the authority of his Father in every area, when he died, that was not the end. Three days later, up from the grave, he arose. And after that, what does he say to his disciples? In Matthew 28, all authority is given me in heaven and earth. Go and disciple the nations. In other words, I have all the power. I have all authority. I have all the right in the universe to save a people. Go and tell that. My pastor was right. We make lousy lords. And when God graciously brings us to the end of ourselves, we say we've made a mess of things, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. And we say I'm making a mess of things because I'm not bowing to the authority of Christ. He's doing that graciously to bring us to the end of ourselves so we will look up and say, you are my Savior and Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord today and be saved. Let's pray.
Father, I'm reminded of the words, the judgment must begin at the house of God. Jesus came to the temple and began it there. And our, as it were, the sifting needs to take place at, at this temple, at this house of your people. And I pray, Lord, today that you would help us as Christians to love the authority of Jesus. How safe we are in him. Lord, for those that are outside of Christ, those that have not bowed the knee, may in this very moment you grant them a new heart to repent and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and gladly embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Help us as a church this year to prove our love to you by obeying your commandments. Not just saying saying and singing, Lord, Lord, but doing what you have told us to do. We don't do that in our own power. We pray, Holy Spirit, you'd enable us to do that. And as we appreciate and marvel in the great gospel of Jesus Christ and his saving grace to us, may that motivate us from love to keep his word. We pray these things for his sake. Amen.